Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to a new week of study uh, as we're going to be finishing off Judges um, this week for sure, I'm pretty sure. Um, but uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the time that we have here each morning and um, for the blessings of fellowship uh, that we have had over the last three years in these studies. Um, we know, Lord, that uh, these situations arose, uh, that we had these studies online by your divine providence, and uh, we are thankful for that. We just pray, Lord, that as we... Um, Think about the things that are coming, the camp meeting, and the people in this movement, those that have been searching and many struggling for various reasons. We uplift uh, 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 Derek, who has asked for prayer. We know, Lord, that uh, he wants to follow the truth, as we all do. And we know that circumstances in this world can often distract us um, from our personal study and devotion. And um, we know, Lord, that the time that we have here to study each day has helped us all spiritually. And we pray for him that uh, he can experience um, that daily presence. We ask, Lord, that as we continue to look at, uh, at the book of Judges and try to understand what it is you have been trying to teach us that we can um, uh, clearly understand it and understand it in a way that we can present it to others very simply. And we're thankful for the light that you've been given us, um, that you've been giving us in regard to the chronology, the symbols, the numbers, the dates, the spans of time, and the various uh, individuals that you have um, provided these gifts to be able to notice these details. And so we invite your presence here now as we open your word together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so good morning again. Now, <clears throat> um, of course, we're finishing off Samson and Delilah, and we're going to come back to that. Uh, particularly, we need to look at some of the details of these verses. But I just want to do a quick review and and present uh, some things that we found on Friday. Now, so one of the things, I mean, the main thing that we saw in the book of Judges when we got to Judges chapter 2 is we saw that Judges chapter 2 verse 1 represented 2001. And that was because this angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bokeh, right? And, and we looked at this and we started going through um, these, these verses and seeing that we could lay out the history of this movement from 9-11 to 2023. And, of course, we began doing that in 2022. And... So we just took these verses as symbolizing this span of time. And as we went through the book of Judges, we could clearly see that that was the case, that each of these stories could bring us back to 9-11 or 11-9, sometimes both. And it would bring us through the different uh, uh, waymarks that e each of these judges represented a waymark where we could zoom into. And we, we recognized that Judges was a zoom into 9-11 uh, as the arrival of the second angel. So that's how we, we understand judges. It, it, and the, the arrival of the second angel, of course, is the Sunday law. But this was the arrival of the second angel being 9-11 as the arrival of the second angel, which isn't, in a sense, it's the Sunday law, but the Sunday law is still something that's future. And, and we're leading to the Sunday law. So we know that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down at the Sunday law, according to Ellen White. But here we have it come down at 9-11. So 
So we know that our history is um, typical of what's going to happen at the Sunday Law. And so each of these judges, and, and be, by the time we get to the end of this week, we're going to be able to go through all of those judges and look at all of these lines and draw some conclusions about these lines. Um, at least that's my, my hope for this week, that we can finish off the book of Judges. And, and then I'm going to be uh, continuing to write these things out, getting notes ready for the camp meeting. But, you know, there might be more things that come up as we go through these, as we do sort of a summary of this study of the book of Judges. I, I know there are some details we haven't fully come to conclusions on. Some of these things are dealing with the chronological spans of the 300 years. Um, we still are uncertain about some of those things. And of course, in the story of Samson and Delilah, there's some things that we're uncertain about because they're still future. Um, so uh, now we know, and when we look at this part in Judges chapter 2, it, it's going to be, and we're just going to go from this part here, uh, Judges 2.19. It came to pass when the judge was dead, that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They cease not from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. So this is just a general description about the judges in the future. So what does it mean when a judge dies? Right. So in, in verse 18, when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was the with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. But when the judge was dead, they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them, to bow down unto them. They ceased not from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. Now we have that marked as 2019. So what does this mean when the judge was dead? How are we taking that? How are we understanding that? So are the, the judges, are they, um, they're not messages. It's, well, they, sim they symbolize messages. They symbolize yeah. messages. Yeah. So could that mean that that message is no longer a a, a concern or I, I don't I, I I mean I understand yeah, think the about this. you're asking. Okay. So when I type in the phrase, and I just did it now, when the judge was dead, I type that into the Gematria calculator. The normal sum of that phrase is 187. <laughs> the, the reverse sum is 326. Uh, the combined sum is 513. And the differential is 139. So 526 in there? Uh, not 326, 326, which which is almost 327, but it's not quite. Um, 513, of course, that would be 153, and 139 would be 391. Wow. But just the normal sum is 187, right? So, so there is a message that died. Right. I mean, according to this. So so what does that mean when the judge was dead? So we have these numbers attached to it. It's attached to the year 2019.
One of the verses that comes to me is remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Proverbs 22, 28. So if you forget your foundation, then of course you're going to go astray. Yeah. And it shows that people maybe at first they held on to what God was showing them through that through that judge. But later on, you know, with the succeeding generations, they departed more and more from those foundations. Well, it's going to be 2020. But, but we know that Jeff was considered dead by Parminder and Tess, right? Yes. Okay. And now, of course, when Jeff awoke from his, you know, retirement, I mean, he now had a different place or a different role than he had had previously, even though, you know, and, and Jeff sort of acknowledged that, especially at first. And, you know, so we, we took up the July 18, 2020 um, proclamation in 2019, right? So Jeff took that up. And, and so, you know, we can bring that, of course, to November 19th. Judges 220 is going to be a symbol of restoration, but that's also the year 2020. And that's going to be when we have the July 18, 2020 um, uh, prediction, you know, fail. Now, what we see in all of this is that God's people in this history, in this history of this movement, have failed, right? God has given messages, and, and we've seen all those messages, and we've had increases of light. But every time a judge comes, a message comes, that message is often rejected. And so um, it has a formalization and an empowerment, but in the end, the majority reject that message. Now, we have this 777 days. So this period of time that we, we generally look at goes from November 9th, 2019 to December 25th, 2021. So that 777 days is this, this period that becomes a real focus, especially when you get into the period of judges and the judges who represent the third angels or the second angels message, the arrival of the second angel, uh, the formalization of the second angel and the empowerment of the second angel. Um, they all are focused upon this 777 day period. That's where they generally uh, are addressing. Now they can of course look forward to 2030 um, and to 2023, but they can be seen as this period of 777 days. Now, when we, um, uh, so when we look at this, we hear we see Judges 219 to 221, that's going to be that period of uh, 777 days. So then we have this period of time, 2022 and 2023, where it talks about that through them I may prove Israel whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. So we can see that all of this work that had been done, um, you know, prior to 9-11, um, you know, we can look at 9-11 as baptism. It could be the crossing of the Jordan. There's lots of symbols that it has. It's the first day of the first month. But now we see that our movement is being represented by this period of the judges. Now, one of the things that we did when we studied the book of Judges is... Um, we studied, uh, well, I think we actually started on chapter 17, did we not? I 
That is, we studied this in connection with, and I can't remember how come we ended up studying that before we went through the book of Judges. But the whole thing about chapter 17 and to 21 in Judges is that this had to do with uh, 17 verse 6. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man which did that which was right in his own eyes. Right? And that's going to be the last verse, the 21-25. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So this represents what, what history, chapter 17 to 21. How do, how do we place that? How do we understand that? I mean, we know that it actually exists before uh, Judges chapter 2, right? It's that early history in Judges chapter 1 after the death of Joshua. These are stories from that period. What does it represent? Could we apply this <clears throat> in a manner of speaking chiastically to our current time? Okay, so explain what you mean by that. Well, if we're if we look at this right now, we have many situations that are going on within the church itself. <laughs> We have people that are within the church lifting up Uriah Smith as a prophet. We have others that are saying that, of course, that the 1843 and the 1850 charts are of, of no effect. We have others that are, are choosing, especially pastors that are choosing to follow steps and directions that are not according to the Bible. So is this not every man following his own heart? Yeah, so, so we can place this. So even though this story happens at the end of the judges, we know that it can be placed earlier. Right. It's, Correct. It's the condition earlier. But it shows that at the end, we're still in the same condition we were at the beginning. That's the way that I understand it. Now, Judges 2125 is Bible verse number 7128. So it has the iteration of all the, the digits in July 18, 2020. So, so the 1872, just in a different order. And and this symbol, like even the July 18, 2020 symbol, I mean, I don't know if we've ever really defined what it means, why God gave us this symbol. But just going back, so we'll come back to that question. So, so we know that we're going to start um, in, uh, and, and the other thing you can see about Judges 2, it's 2 verse 1 to 23, um, but the whole story of the judges, it goes 21 chapters. And that can also go from 2001 to 2021. So to the end of our 777 structure. Um, so this is describing the history of this movement in connection with what happens to the church. So we could look at all of this, this situation, there's no king. Every man's doing what's right in his own eyes. To me, that would describe the Adventist church prior to 9-11. And, and why I say that is in 1989, at the time of the end, and not everybody here can remember the Adventist church at that time, uh, so I'm not sure what Iran means. 12, 25 is similar to 12. You're saying the 12th month? Uh, just was connecting uh, December 25th. Yeah. Yeah, so you have the symbol, symbol there in, well, obviously, 
all of the digits of December 25th, 2021 are in that 2125. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, so getting back to this, uh, this, this, uh, the situation in the church. So prior to 1989, um, you don't see a lot of fanaticism in Adventism. You have conservative Adventists, and and we have basically movements that are beginning in Adventism, that are are within Adventism, not offshoots, but just movements within Adventism. Lots of conservative um, preachers, many of them still church preachers prior to 1989. After 1989, we start to have a rise of more what I would call independent ministries. So these start to uh, increase, and you're going to have some of these are have ministers attached to them, but some of them don't. Some of them are just lay people. But at first, it starts usually with some, some ministers or other. And we have this happening just prior to 1989. You're going to have Light Bearers Ministry, for instance, beginning in, I think it's 86 or something like that. Um, but of course, you know, it's just a small ministry. It's going to grow into a much bigger ministry later on. And, but this is happening throughout Adventism. Now, when we, now, and what you're not getting with many of these ministries is, is much fanaticism, right? You're, you're, you're getting fairly solid. I mean, there are different views and different emphases. Often there's an emphasis upon righteousness by faith in many of the ministries. Uh, lots of them are looking at the Sunday law that's coming um, and, um, you know, just trying to warn the world because the church isn't doing its work. And so many ministries arise to do this work. And and Jeff's ministry appears to be just one of those many types of ministries. But he has, of course, a very particular um, a message that is different from anything else. And that has to do with these lines. Um, and when we get to nine, uh, you know, 9-11, so we get to 2001, I think here we're going to see the multiplication of errors that is fanaticism all kinds of erroneous ideas begin to multiply within adventism and i don't know if other people have that sort of same general perspective uh, that i have um but definitely there was not and, and part of this could be attributed to the internet as well right so we know with the internet um it helps to spread all kinds of ideas that people might not be exposed to. They might not in their local church ever hear of these things. And I don't know how much the internet has to do with that. It definitely helps whether that is the cause. I don't know. Um, but do people have that same general perspective who would have been around in that time? I don't know how many of you would have been observing these things or not. I was not an Adventist until 2001. Yeah. yeah. Now, Dwight, you know, you're a bit older than me, but, you know, you weren't always in the church, but could you say that that's generally correct? Well, it's more than gener generally correct. I mean, as, as I have given my testimony, Yeah. my family came into this church Roughly about 1970 to 1972. Yeah. I left the church about 1979. I came back about 2000 mm -hmm. to a church I no longer recognized. Mm -hmm. Whether I have attended a church doing a communion style along that, along the lines of that of a, of a Catholic service. Mm hmm whether I have attended a church that where the pastor presents that Adam and Eve didn't really do anything wrong or where I've attended a church where the pastor 
presents that there is nothing to fear from the lake of fire, that this is just daddy taking us to the lake. Yes. All of these things are permeating throughout Adventism, along with issues where they really don't understand righteousness by faith, whether they are following Wheeland and Short's version, or whether they're following Jack Sequera, or where they are rejecting Ellen White in favor of Uriah Smith. Mm -hmm. We yeah, have various winds of doctrine doing, going through Every now. man's doing what's right in his own eyes, so to speak. That's the point. Yeah. And, you know, well, we were in Warburg Church yesterday, and, and their quarterly is on the three cosmic messages. Mark Finley, of course, wrote the quarterly. We talked about this before. Um, and, uh, you know, so I don't like the way they do Sabbath school in Warburg anymore, because since COVID now they have a microphone that they pass around. You know, you don't have that intimacy of just sitting close together. People are spread out around the church now. It's just one big Sabbath school. And of course, the interactions then are kind of slow. And but I did make some comments and I read uh, some spiritual prophecy quotes regarding the first, second and third angels messages that we know need to know their place. And that we can't remove a peg or a pin of their location. And um, because in this quarterly, there is nothing about the first and second and third angels messages when they were given. You know, um, it's just a bunch of fluff. All sounds kind of nice, you know, on the surface. But it's not really about the three angels messages. Uh that we need because I, mean, I read the part about you can't have a third without the first and second, that these messages need to be repeated, that we need to know their location, all these things. And, you know, Adventism now, the, the three angels' messages are no more uh, real and, and represent anything other. It's similar to, you know, a Catholic crucifix, it, it doesn't mean anything. It's just, uh, a symbol that has is devoid of meaning right because it's not understood the cross of christ isn't really understood about what that actually means just because you have a cross doesn't mean that you know you understand it what that symbol is you know supposed to represent i mean obviously it has its pagan origins too it's not really a christian symbol but you understand what i mean they can have a symbol of a cross without actually taking up Christ's cross. And, and so we have the same thing with the three angels' messages. But, but your point, and, and my point as well, is that in Adventism, all kinds of beliefs exist. Adventism was much more unified when I became an Adventist in 1982. Um, you know, People there, you know, obviously there was a new theology element that had um, crept into the church, but the general Adventist was still relatively conservative. I mean, they believed in the spirit of prophecy. They believed in the 2300 days and the 70 weeks. They knew how to give Bible studies on these things. Um, and what happened from the time I got baptized to uh, 1989, the changes had begun quite rapidly and so the conservative aspect of the church had had sort of awoken and and started to fight against this liberal element that now was that had been growing but now was sort of and especially since glacier view um seeking to gain control of the church and and then you know so when 1989 occurred, um, the fall of the Soviet Union, the church really wasn't interested in it. And of course, by 9-11, it had completely abandoned any sort of um, looking at anything happening in the world as having prophetic significance. Um, yeah, so Angela says that ecumenism is um, basically the, why we have a multitude of beliefs. And that could be part of it. I, I don't really think it's the main reason. 
I don't think ecumenism has caused that within Adventism, because uh, I think this goes back. I mean, if you want to say ecumenism, you know, was happening in 1919, I don't think Adventists were joining with the Protestants in, in actuality. They were just wanting to be accepted. So, I mean, in, I guess in that sense. Um, but but this, these are seeds that were planted a long time ago. And they, okay. took, they took four generations to bear their fruit. Are we talking <clears throat> ecumenism or ecumenicalism? Well, What's the it's the here? same thing. Ecumenism is just... Uh, I I'm not do recall I, I, back... Yeah, sorry, George. I do recall all back, back in the 60s, and don't forget, I was attending Jesuit services and everything, and it was very clear that we were to filter in and enter into the into the Protestant churches, our fallen brethren, yeah. and return them to the fold of the Holy Mother Church. And I have seen it in Adventism. Yeah, I'm just saying that this that what we see as the multitude of beliefs goes back further. Right. That's for sure. It's paganism. It's it's really got strong inroads with this woke garbage and everything else. I mean, the church has definitely declined horribly. Yeah, well, because the church declined. So what you end up having is you have different groups trying to restore um, what was lost, right? So you have people saying, well, we used to believe this about the Trinity or we used to, um, or, you know, we should we should believe this about whatever it is. Um, all of these different ideas. Um, <coughs> yeah, so you had an Easter service this morning at an SDA church, your church or something around. You have a little chat note there. Yeah, Easter sunrise service is definitely are something you would not have seen happen wow. when I became an Adventist in 82. So That's very odd. I know that they did start, though, in the 90s. There were some liberal Adventist churches doing Easter sunrise services. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, I know you didn't attend it around. I wasn't accusing you of anything. <laughs> um, but I was just wondering if it was at your church. So, so. Well, <clears throat> there, have been, there have been Easter sunrise services for several years at Walla Walla, an Adventist university. Right. Yeah. And the, the most egregious of all that I, I had been aware of was an Adventist pastor wearing a cassock doing an Easter service back in St. Louis, Missouri. What's a cassock again? A cassock is what a, a priest would wear. The robe thing? Right. Right, that's yeah. what I thought. Jake. So, so, but you know, the problem that that we see, we see this problem in the church, but it's presented at the end, end of judges, and I think that's because, even though we try to distance ourselves from what we see in the church, we are actually of the same spirit. We have the same problems. Very right. You know, and, and that's the problem that I see in the movement is that we think we aren't like other men. Right. We think because we believe differently, whatever that means, that we profess to believe certain things, that somehow that makes us better. And, and the spirit that we have is one of a pharisaical spirit that we're better than other people. We're not like the church, but yet we are worse than the church. Because we know better. Yeah, we should know better. We shouldn't be in the situation that we are in this movement today. Right? We've, we've been given a responsibility and we've shirked that responsibility and put the blame on other people. And we can't do that. Right? We're attacking and hindering the work while professing to uphold it. And so we have to figure this out, you know, individually. What is it that we have done that has hindered God's work? And 
and so to me this is is a huge part of what you know we've learned as we've gone through the book of judges that that were unconverted like the disciples were that we were not ready for the responsibilities that would have been um, foisted upon us if Nashville had been attacked on July 18, 2020. We would not have been able to endure uh, the outcry. And we, we were looking at it as, well, we're going to be vindicated. You know, our friends are going to listen to us now, right? Our family's going to listen to us. And that was a very foolish idea. We should never have that opinion. Well, for the... Or attitude, sorry. The thing is, we would know that the world would have turned against us. If that event had occurred, uh, we would have been blamed for it, that we would have been the cause of it, because people would not just accept that we predicted something. There would be all kinds of rumors and stories about how we actually were involved, right? You know, either directly or indirectly. So um, it wouldn't have been... Uh, an easy thing for us to face. And one is we just didn't have the character to face such a thing. So, so when we look at this, this whole structure of the judges and we say, well, you know, they put these stories at the end about the earlier history. And if you, of course, if you read commentaries, these are just collection of stories and they were just appended at the, at, at the end of whatever was the book of judges was. Um, but we believe that this is purposeful. This structure of the book of Judges tells us something. And, and so it tells us our situation. And we can see that every man just does what's right in his own eyes. And, and that is not how it's to be. This is the thing that troubles me the most, you know, being separated from my brethren, right? I mean, not being involved uh, you know, with the American group and the Canadian group and having like my own studies, I don't like it. Right. But I don't know how to change it. Cause I, I definitely can't change other people. And, you know, so I'm seeking everything I can to be in unity with my brethren because God is not leading individuals. He's leading a movement. And now it doesn't mean that we need some kind of organization or church. Um, that to me is, is the result of a failure if that is going to be the case. Right. Right. I mean, because if we are connected with Christ and we're connected and, or, and united with our brethren, we don't need some institution to hold us together. No, you wouldn't have that need, really. Now, so, so I believe in church order. I believe that we need to have a united effort, but we need to be connected to Christ. And, you know, in reading the history of, of Adventism through Ellen White's testimonies that Heidi and I have been doing, um, you know, we can see quite clearly that uh, the reason organization occurred is that the church was so divided um, that it would have accomplished nothing had it not organized. In order for it to be a worldwide movement, it had to organize. But that's because people were unconverted. So the councils that you see in the spirit of prophecy, I mean, she's, she's talking to people who are extremely worldly. Um, they might not appear that from our perspective nowadays, but there's really no difference. So, so this is the, the boat that we're in now. Um, so I'm just going to shift a little bit and go to this chart here um, and sort of summarize some things. Now, <clears throat> now this is a chart which I just uh, drew up the last couple of days. It's not really complete yet. I didn't have a lot of time. And... Um, what this chart is, is um, the first days of the first months um, in 1533 BC, 457, 27 AD, 1844, and 2030, with 9-11 placed in there. And um, 
and these spans of time. Now, we had talked before about the 1,301,000 days. Now, Stephen had done a chart um, dealing with 1,301 years. And that chart... Um, I do this right. Just show you this. And Stephen, are you there? Yes. Yeah. So, can you explain this chart, how it came about, when you made this, and what do you think it means? Well, just a few, uh, maybe about a week or two ago. Okay. So, now you uh, you had know. seen the three. Had you seen this spent? 1,301 years before? Well, I think um, when that first came up, uh, that was a while ago, but I had forgotten about it. And then okay. until you brought it up again, then it sort of, I, I couldn't remember where, what, what had I done that I seen that 1301. Yeah. So uh, I was just really comparing sort of similarities with uh, the 98 years of Shem to when he goes into the Ark. And then we know that Eli as well, we're told, is 98 years. You have an Ark there in each case. And um, when yeah. the Ark is taken, he's 98 years old. Yes, yeah, so that's when he dies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but it's when the Ark is taken, he dies. Ichabod. Now, as far as putting this uh, 1187 BC, um, that's based upon. Yeah, so that would be um, understanding that the uh, the ark is uh, set up in the tabernacle. Yeah. Um, I'm going by what Judges tells us. It's uh, going by the date in Judges 14 that Caleb is. 85, you can work out that there's like a six year period there. Yeah. And so Ellen White says it's 300 years from that their time. So that would be from 1487. Yeah. So that, that's just where the numbers fall. Yeah. Okay. So whether, whether it's she's maybe rounding right. off or not, I don't know, but I'm just going by what she says. Yeah, okay. And so based on what she says, if we just take that literally, we get this three, 1,301 years, right? Yes. So with the 98 years at either side. Yes. Right. And so you've got the shut door on the arc. That's part of what you're looking at there comparing to the arc being taken. Mm -hmm. There's gives us that. Now, okay, so, so if we go back to my diagram here, um, I mean, this is just tying us from these first days of the first month. So we know the first time they begin to count the, the months, they number them, is in 1533 BC. Prior to that, they don't number the months. They have names, right? You don't have a first month. There is no first month. Months just go in a circle. Um, you have different calendars, different ways in which you're going to count periods of time in the story of Noah. You're going to be counting in the 600th year of Noah's life, the first month of his 600th year. So it's going to be in the second month of his 600th year uh, that the flood begins, right? And, and so people just assume, well, that's the biblical calendar, but it's long before the biblical calendar was created. And and even though Moses wrote the, um, uh, you know, the book of Genesis, he wrote it prior to God giving him uh, that the month begins in Abib, right? He's going to give it, he's going to write that when he's in the wilderness, Ella White says, that he's going to write out those books, um, the book of Genesis. So, um so obviously, you know, 
there's no reason to assume that that's the first day of the first month, you know, is, or the, the numbering of the months in the story of Noah is somehow connected with something that happens later because he writes it out earlier. And he says it's the 600th year of Noah's life. So, so he's numbering the months in that way. So the first day of the first month begins in 1533. And in the story of Ezra, we have this pattern going from the first day of the first month to the first day of the first month, right? Because that's the 354 days from Ezra 7 to 10. That's, that's the period of time it's going to give us. Now we have this 1,301,000 days. What's the significance of that number? We had dealt with this earlier. So... The uh, 1301 is the 212th prime. Yeah, so it's the 212th prime here. And um, so we had it here in this other chart, uh, going from April 12, 1533 BC to April 5, 2030. And so um, it's uh, 35,062 years, which if divided by two, that is, we're just taking it like this is a span of time. And, and I didn't look for what the center of this is, but um, you'd have 1,781 years. So I know it would be sometime, uh, you know, 300 and some. I think AD would be the center of this. But um, anyway, if we take that 1781, we can see we have that. 178, the 187, which adds up to 365. You could just go either way, like a mirror. So that's how you can take that 3562 divided in half. And then you can use these as mirrors to show that this represents a period of time, 365 days in a year. And, and that number is the 212th prime. And what would be the significance then of the 212? I mean, it's the 212th prime, which is interesting. Um, maybe the year 2012. Okay, could so it could be year the 2012. It could be, you know, February 12th or something like that. I don't know. If we have February 12th, I know we do somewhere. Um, and then the Mayan long count calendar, it's... 130100. Zero, zero, zero. That number, if we take that number on the Mayan calendar, it's the second month, 12th day um, in the Islamic calendar in the 1435 year of the Hajj. Hijra. That's it. Hijra. Okay. So so we have this symbol here, this, this span of time. And um, What else, what else is significant about it? Now, there's, there's probably lots more we could find. Okay, that's what it was. I knew there was some, Adilio's presentation, right? So Adilio's presentation was February 12th, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. that's what's on that chart in front of you. Um, yes, there it is down below. So February 12, 2022, that's 49 days after. So that's a symbol of Pentecost in that context, because he's going to be, um, seven weeks after December 25th, 2021. Okay. Um, Yeah, so I think that was the main thing. Yeah, the center would be 249 AD. I don't know if that means anything. If there's some event there. But anyway, we have this, this structure. So...
So the first day of the first month to the first day of the first month is significant. It gives us symbols in, in that span. Now, uh, the one that we had figured out Friday, so I was looking at um, from the first day of the first month in 457 BC to the first day of the first month in 2030. And of course, that would be significant because we're using the first day of the first month, which is April 26th, 457 BC, when Ezra leaves Babylon and he's going to go to Jerusalem. And we know that when we lined up um, in the week of Christ study, you know, we were, we were lining these things up, right? So we were taking this, um, and, and we're going to see that with 27 AD as well. Um, so that period of time from 457 to the first day of the first month in 2030 is 907,977 days. So, so we have all of these, these things that connect all of these first days of the first month together. Now, we can take this span of time. So the interesting thing about this, and so I did this before on the calculator, might as well do it again this way. So I have 9,977 days, 907,977. Now, if I divide this by 360, so the prophetic year, I get this number, which is close to 2520 prophetic years, but it's a little longer. It's also on the board behind you. Yeah, I know, but I'm going to show it here on the calculator. And so what I did is I minus 2520, and I get this decimal, which is 2.158. So we got the 158 there. That's that symbol of um, 158 BC and the midnight cry symbol. Um, but what I would do is, whoops, shouldn't have done that. So if I bring this number here, what I would do is multiply it again by the number I divided it by to see how many days it represents. The number of days it represents is. 777. Of course, it's got this decimal, and I'm not sure why. That's because I'm using the standard calculator instead of the scientific one. But anyway, what it is, is if we take 2520 times 360, we get this number, which if we add 777 days to it, we get the span of time. So to me, that's very significant. We can look at this chart and we can see that when we take 457 BC, we can connect it to 2030 with this very specific number. That is, it's 200, 2520 times 360 days, which is a prophetic year. Now we know with 9-11, we had taken this 354. So uh, do it this way here. So I didn't finish off this chart. And we're gonna connect 9-11. Now 9-11 represents the first day of the first month. That as a symbol, 9-11 is the first day of the first month. Midnight's the first, no, fifth day of the fourth month. The midnight cries the first day of the fifth month. And the Sunday law is the 10th day of the seventh month. So we have this symbol here. Now, this is 390, um, uh, 354, I don't know what, 395, 354 days um, as a symbol. And what we, we say that that 354 days, which we begin with Ezra, one verse one to the first day of the first month um, in 456 BC, right? So we, there's 354 days that we can count from 9 11 
to 2030 in two different ways, right? So if we count from 9-11, and what I have to do here is add this. So this is going to be the 10th day of the seventh month. in 2030 and let me copy this here Put this at the bottom it's true there we go so this is 354 days times 30 Right, so it's 354 prophetic months, and that's going to lead us to the 10th day of the seventh month in 2030. Right, now, if we count 354 times 29.530587, Yeah, so 25, 20 prophetic years to plus 777 seven, seven days is just another way of saying uh, that span of time that we talked about. Okay. Now, this, this span of time here, this is going to go from not 9-11 itself, but from the start of 9-11. So that is that month that 9-11 happens in, which is going to be August 22nd. So I'm not putting that detail here in this chart. But we can see that we can take a prophetic month and apply it, or we can take a lunar month and actually go whole lunar months. And we will get these two different dates. Now, obviously, they're 186 days apart from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month in a cardinal count. That is the 10th day of the seventh month is the 187th day of the Jewish year. Um, so we have here at the end, this symbol of July 18, 2020. So I'm just going to put it here as um, just like this. I'm just going to put 187, right? So obviously it's not, Really, one eight. You know, it's 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 the ordinal count that I'm using there. So, <clears throat> inclusive count. So we can see that that one eight seven is part of this symbol, right? So, so in this structure, we we have implied, obviously, in the story of Ezra, it's going to all be about the start of the seventy weeks, which is going to begin on the tenth day of the seventh month. 187 days from when he leaves Babylon. So on the 187th day from when he leaves Babylon is going to be the center of the chiasm from the first day of the fifth month to the 20th day of the ninth month. And, and we can see that that's going to be representing the 20th day of the ninth month is going to be December 25th, 2021, right? So, so everything is all tied together in these wheels within wheels. It's, it's a very complex, very involved structure, but it's based on some very simple uh, ideas that come directly from God's word. So, you know, we have this symbol of 187. So, you know, ask the question, what does 187 represent or what does 18720 represent or 18 you know 187 all of these different iterations of 187 what is this symbol about why has god given us this specific symbol as our main symbol it, i mean it's tied to the 777 as well so there are other symbols are tied tied to it but why has he given us this What does it represent?
What's its primary significance? Well, it could symbolize a, the close of probation of the 187 days. Right. So it symbolizes the close of probation, the Day of Atonement, which is the time in which we are living. Right? Now, that it, the temptation here would be to say, well, here we have this symbol that's pointing to the 10th day of the seventh month in 2030. Right? And and remember, if we go from October 22nd, 1844, to the 10th day of the seventh month in 2030, it is 2300 months. Now, we got to the first day of the first month through the week of Christ study. Um, and, and that's going to give us the first day of the first month in 2030 by counting 2300 lunar months from April 19th, 1844, right? So... So we, we could just count from there. But if we count it from the 10th day of the seventh month in 2030, obviously it's going to be, uh, the you know, if we count back, it's going to connect October 22nd. So the 2300 months connect both dates. And so we see that 2030 here is, is about the first day of the first month and about the 10th day of the seventh month. That is, Millerite history brings us to the 10th day of the seventh month in the story of Ezra, but it doesn't bring us to the first day of the first month in Millerite history. We don't get from April 19th to the first day of the first month in 1845, right? We don't have that completion of the story of Ezra. So the story of Ezra is going to give us the starting point of the 70 weeks and thus the 2300 days. But it's also gonna give us this period of divorcement. And, and, and it's gonna be on the 20th day of the ninth month on December 25th, 2021, that they come for this repentance, being married to the strange wives, and then this three month period, which is gonna be 88 days, cardinal count from the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month in which these divorce proceedings occur. So we have this first day of the first month, but it's also giving us the 10th day of the seventh month in 457 BC. But in this hidden way, we have to look at this chiastic structure, right, with these periods of three days. Um, so it ties us to Millerite history, but Millerite history is now being completed in our history. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. So, so our history is, is obviously connected to Millerite history in various ways. But one way it's connected is with the story of Ezra connecting 9-11 to the first day of the first month in 2030. So we can see, what, whatever this means, um, that it's pointing to this movement coming to something that's parallel to what happened in Millerite history. And we've already understood this, that this movement is repeating Millerite history. Now, whether these dates are literal dates that are going to occur, that something's going to happen, on those dates or not is insignificant in their application. That is, we can see that they're giving us information about what this movement is about. It's giving us information about what our role and responsibility is and that we have a message to proclaim prior to the Sunday law. And that that Sunday law is not going to come if we don't fulfill our role. We, we can't just be talking about, you know, this, the Sunday law coming and think that that's fulfilling our role. We can't be going back and just repeating, you know, all we know as Seventh-day Adventists about the Catholic Church and about 
the United States and about the mark of the beast and all of these things that, that we, we, we know, and if we don't know them, we should, uh, rehearsing those things is not fulfilling our role, is it? Because we're really no different than the church. Because did the church fulfill its role, you know, after the death of Ellen White? No. No, they, they ended up rejecting the light. So they, they professed to believe Adventists, professed to believe in the truth. But they didn't act as if they believed in the truth. They weren't acting as if they believed in the truth, even in Ellen White's day. She says, you just make a profession of a belief in the testimonies, but you show by your actions that you don't. So we're showing by our actions that we don't believe in all the things we profess to believe in. Because we're doing nothing. And so we have to do something. The first thing we have to do, though, is come to the upper room. We have to come together. Now, you can't just bring people together who aren't united with Christ. Because how we come together is to be united with Christ. Right? Right. Now, just bringing us physically together doesn't make us together. A work has to be done upon our hearts. And God's given us these messages to show this work. To show how we have failed. And how if we continue to set time and, and believe that the Sunday law is imminent. That, that we're not doing the work that he asked us to do. Now, we need to be warning the world somehow. How that happens, that's that's something that God is going to show us how we're going to warn Adventists, how, how this movement is going to happen. When we look at it from our perspective, it seem, all seems impossible. But this is how it always is, right? Because if we just thought we could do it, you know, we saw, oh, we just do this and we just do that. And it's all going to happen nicely and neatly. Um, we wouldn't need God, but we do need God. We need a dependence upon him in order to accomplish this work. So, you know, I don't necessarily have the answer of, of all the details, but I do know what, what the steps are that we have to take. And those are not easy steps. Um, it basically amounts to, uh, you know, cleaning our own room we have to start somewhere and and if we understand how to start a, a large and difficult task um you know if you're going to go on a backpacking trip and you're going to walk five thousand miles you just do it one step at a time right you have to start on something but you also have to know that you're going in the right direction that you have a purpose and a goal. You can't be presumptuous, right? So there's a lot involved in it. <clears throat> now, um, so just a little bit more looking at this chart, we can see that there's some interesting spans of time, um, you know, from the first day of the first month in 27 AD. So this is going to be the date that lines up with the first day of the first month in the week of Christ, that is April 5th, 2030. That is the first day of the first month in 2030. So that's how I first arrived at 2030, right? Now, um, we know from the first day of the first month in 1844, uh, that's going to be, I'm just going to blow one of these things here. That's going to be that 186 years, right? So if you go here, first day of the first month. Um, 
there, that's going to be this. Um, and it's going to have two different ways of looking at it, right? So it's going to be 186 years, and that's not Gregorian years, but biblical years. And it's also going to be 187 prophetic years. and 20 prophetic months. That's a lot of... Right? Maybe I could shorten that, but I can just go in PY and PN. Oh, that's not a Y, that's a 7. PY. Prophetic years. Oh. We'll do it that way. Right? Now, of course, it would also be the case if we went from the 10th day of the seventh month in 1844 to the 10th day of the seventh month in 2030, it would be 186 years and 187 prophetic years and 20 prophetic months, right? Now, I didn't put these, a lot of these, the days, the spans of time, but <clears throat> now there's one there, the 1946, we have 1946 lunar months from the first day of the first month in 1844 to 9-11. What would that represent? 1946, does that have any significance? I know, it's just the number of lunar months. Aside from being Trump's birth, birth year. Yeah, I know it's Trump's birth year. So I thought about that. But I don't know what Trump would have to do with 9-11 per se. I mean, he was there at 9-11. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, so it's there. Um. Now, the reverse sum of Judges 2125 is 1086, Iran says. So that's just, um, that's taking the gematria of, of that passage. So, so the question that we, we have to ask ourselves about, about these lines, so we know that we're going to have... Um, If we go to Samson and Delilah's line, for instance, oops. Um, what we're going to try this week is to, just to go over all these lines again, you know, just review them and sort of see what things we notice now that we've gone through them all in, in detail. Um, but here we had put April 8th, so April 8th, 2023, as the formalization of this message that arrived December 25th, 2022. Now, um, that of course is just, we're marking Dwight presenting to the Canadian group that we're making this sort of more formal invitation. We begin that um, yesterday, right? And then we're saying that the second angel empowered is the camp meeting, July 24th to 30th, right, 2023. Now, is this kind of presumptuous to, you know, put this as the empowerment of this second angel's message in the Samson and Delilah line? Now, another way to look at this is Samson and Delilah on the line above in the Judges is the April 5th, 2030 date. And, and we can see that Samson and Delilah is going to be a zoom into that. But in zooming into it, it's going to bring us to 
the 10th day of the seventh month in 2030, not the first day of the first month in 2030. And, and the reason we placed it there had to do with an observation that Dwight had made. So we saw that the first angel arrives, the symbol there is going to be 777, Stephen's, uh, Uh, the insight that was given to him regarding uh, the 777 years, but it's also going to be at the end of 777 days. And we're saying that that period of 777 days represents a period of darkness. It's, it's darkness in relation to what? What is the particular darkness that this line is addressing? What is the darkness here? What is the light? Because this light comes in response to darkness. So what is the darkness if we look at the light that is being represented here? The darkness on the Samson and Delilah line? Yeah. So we have the Samson and Delilah line. It has a period of darkness. Now, when we we looked at that verse, Judges 16, verse 1. We saw that when then went Samson to Gaza and saw there an harlot and went in unto her. Now, the symbol there for Gaza is going to be that raphia symbol because raphia is 22 miles from Gaza, but it's all part of what they call the Gaza Strip. And, and this is going to represent... Uh, you know, Christ coming to this movement on December 25th, 2021. And we're going to have basically two messages. One is the confirmation of the 777. But then Colin's study, the December 25th, 20, that's going to be the first angel arriving. So there's some darkness that is occurring in this period of time that is this 777 time. Now, the 16 verse 1 um we're relating that, of course, to um, the wave offering, right? And then you're going to have seven weeks to Pentecost. That's going to be Odilio's study. But it, that period of darkness is what precedes that wave offering. So, um, so there's some kind of wave offering that's done. This 777 period that, that we had, we're saying is a period of darkness in relationship to this light that comes to this movement starting there. So the question is, what particularly is that darkness? Well, what's coming to me is Matthew 9, 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. So that goes along with everyone doing what was right in his own eyes. Okay, there. So, so what we have is, is a movement that is not organized. That is, even though we, you know, we go back to 9-11, we saw what happened, or 11-9. 11-9, Parminder's movement closes its probation. And then we're in this period in which God is giving us light. So it, it's not like that, you know, a period of darkness that you just reject all of that as, as darkness, all of the light we received. Now, this brings a thought, Heidi and I were discussing this uh, the other day regarding, um, so we're just going to close here with this thought. Um, uh, Mark Bruce, back in 2016, uh, started to, to recognize some things which were partly correct. Um, that is, he recognized that there was a period of darkness from 9-11. Now, of course, he didn't understand how to address that. So he would just say basically all of the things that we learned from 9-11 
were darkness. At least that's how it was interpreted. And, and this, of course, ended up to his uh, separation from this movement. And, and I was, um, you know, I mean, I wasn't really happy with how that came about because there was lots of rumors and gossip and, and you know, instead of actually addressing the points that, that he was making and studying them out, it was basically uh, ad hominem attacks to address what he was saying. And, you know, and I was, you know, reading his website, trying to understand it. I was uh, emailing him and back and forth trying to uh, sort out what was going on. And um, so, so anyway, you know, the point is that, you know, he was partially right, that we can look at a period when God is giving us light and we can still address it as a period of darkness. So I don't think he was essentially wrong. It's just either he brought it to an extreme or was forced to bring it to an extreme. But what we can see is that even during that period where we had all of this light coming to us, there is a darkness. And that darkness has to do with the way in which this movement was operating. Um, it definitely wasn't a united movement. And and so when we came to Colin's presentation, it, sort of some of that came to the head in how when Colin was presenting and how I was asking him questions that shows that this movement needed some light. And Colin was presenting light, but that light wasn't really being heated. And it should have been studied and, and approached correctly, but it wasn't. Right. Instead of it, it became always about a party spirit. Whose side are you on on an issue? So, Which is so, still there. Yeah. As, and, of la as of yesterday. Yeah. And, and when we can't have that, I mean, how do we think that God's going to bless this movement if we keep acting the same way that we we have been acting? We can't expect it. And we can't expect, you know. You know, that somehow, well, if people just listen to me, then everything's going to be fine, right? If I could just have people listen to my presentations, you know, if anybody has that kind of idea, you know, that somehow I have all the light, that's a wrong idea, right? Because we need each other. This movement, God has given light to different people. I think that becomes apparent, you know, that God's doing all this. He's He's, we've come together because of him. All the things that have transpired have happened basically because of him, in spite of ourselves. So, yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah. And so, so that's where we're at. And, and, and when we look at that, that number, just dealing with that last chart, just to kind of finish this off, um, you know, when I look at this, this, um, this, this period of days, so we know that this days is 2520 times 360. But we have to add 777, right? right? To get this number. this way it's better okay right that's what that number is but you can see if we take that 777 days in our line if we just take it out of there it is 2520 times 360 right in a sense we can take that 777 days from november 9th to december 25th 2021 right we can take it out of there and we can see that 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 isn't needed. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, just forget it all, but I'm just saying that that, that is, needs to be added in to get that whole number. But that number that exists without it, you know, which is basically seven times 360 times 360, right? That is that number of days. 
if we add the 777 to it. Otherwise, it's just 907,200 days. So, so the significance of those seven, seven days is that it helps complete this span of time from the first day of the first month in 457 to the first day of the first month in 2030. Okay, so uh, let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study. We ask that you can bring us together again tomorrow morning to study your word. And we ask that your angels can watch over each person. Be with us as we continue to walk with you. Help us to recognize your presence and to reflect your character in all we do. We pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.